Joining us now is Nigel Farage. As the president is set to land in England, he's going to be meeting with Theresa May. He's going to be spending some time in Scotland, undoubtedly at his golf course up there. Uh, and he joins us now with Theresa May's own internal challenges and, and, of course, involving Brexit. Nigel, how are you? I'm very well indeed and fascinated by what Donald Trump said this morning. Uh, really interesting. Um, it's noticeable that with the anti-Russian hysteria that has swept the West, the Germans have always been very quiet about it. Um, and, of course, you know, Donald Trump, as he often does, um, has sort of said the unsayable, because the former German Chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, is a director of that pipeline company. So, well done him. Yeah, Gazprom, Rosneft, he has, he has involvement in all these major companies now. He's the, he's the single... Uh, largest consultant from Europe working now in the Ush Russian energy sector. And again, he's one person, but we, he, he doesn't come by himself to that game. I mean, this, there's a huge amount of money being made. And look, that's fine. It's, pe people make money. But I, when people say it's not about the money, it always is about the money. And Donald Trump just said, look, we can't keep carrying this burden with you guys, except for four countries, and we're one of them, who who do spend 2% of our GDP on this, on yeah. our military. Everybody else has to yeah, pony I mean, up and you've got to do it faster. Yeah. I mean, that's the real point here, isn't it? The real point is there are 29 members of NATO, only a handful are paying the basic 2%. Um, and what's really happening, if one's honest about it, is there are basically 25 countries here freeloading of everybody else, including Germany, who, by the way, only spend 1.2% of their GDP on defense. So I think NATO has actually been in trouble for some time. Um, and I just wish Theresa May would play a more, you know, a more prominent role in this. You know, she should be the broker, really, between mm. Donald Trump and the rest of the European countries. And yet, you know, she goes to NATO and says nothing. I think it's all very disappointing. Um, of course, underlying all of this, Laura, the untold story is that the European Union itself uh, with its own Walter Mitty-like dreams, they want to build their own European army, and they're actually actively encouraging countries to spend less than 2%. So, you know, if anyone's threatening the security of Europeans, um, it's not the American president, it's actually the European project itself. Well, let's talk about that as it relates um, to your home country. And we have this big uh, discussion. It's not an official state visit, but... Donald Trump set to meet with Theresa May. They're going to meet in Oxfordshire and also at Chequers. They're not meeting in central London. Uh, I think they're not meeting there, right, because of the protests. Uh, and so the president having to, you know, skirt those. They're going to go to Windsor Castle, I guess, at one point. But what do you expect out of this uh, meeting? And then we'll get into the Theresa May wow. uh, internal problems. <laughs> if I'm being frank, very little, because the honest truth is that the plan that Theresa May put forward last week and got approved by her cabinet would in fact make it very difficult for any genuine free trade agreement to be struck between Britain and America. Um, on NATO, as I've said already, uh, the British Prime Minister is not standing up and defending the American President's point of view, which he jolly well should be. Um, and it's very difficult for me to see um, any agreement happening between these two human beings. I'm afraid that our our Prime Minister is incredibly politically correct, um, always happy. I mean, she criticized the President in the House of Commons the other day, saying that it was awful that American policy was to separate children from their parents if they were illegal immigrants. But you know something, Laura? The British government do that as well. We separate children from parents. So she's always joining the politically correct tide of criticism of Donald Trump. And I... Uh, to be frank, and I'm very disappointed in this because, you know, there's uh, hardly anybody in England who's got such strong links with America as I've got. And I want to see the Atlantic get narrower, but it's very difficult for me to see anything constructive coming out of this at all. Well, what, what is the latest um, with the, you know, I think the lack of uh, understanding, uh, to, say, to, say, to put it nicely, the part of Americans who who haven't really followed this Brexit move. I mean, it was supposed to be Brexit. Everyone's excited about Brexit, but then the Euro elites never really give up. They just go away for a short period of time, but then they try to 
you know, claw their way back. And Theresa May uh, wanted to make this a much more, a much less uh, abrupt uh, ending of of Britain's ties to the EU, and that resulted in Boris Johnson's uh, resignation, mm. res- resignation of another cabinet member. Where are we? How could this ultimately uh, play out regarding Brexit? Well, well, I think the term less abrupt, uh, frankly, is far too polite for what Theresa May did last Friday. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, what she did was pretty much a betrayal of what Brexit voters had supported, and that was for us to have a clean break and a different set of relationships with the European Union. And and what she's trying to do is to keep us tied as closely as possible, whilst frankly lying to us in every speech, saying we are genuinely taking back control when her plan means we're not. Um, It led to, firstly, uh, a man called David Davis resigning. He resigned pretty much on the spot. Boris left it a few days. Um, And a cynic would say he sort of licked his finger and worked out which way the wind was blowing. Um, But I'm pleased that Boris has gone too. And you know something? I'll tell you this. I have never seen in my entire life Middle England as enraged and angry as it is this week. I mean, there are, you know, the Daily Telegraph, one of our most conservative newspapers, and I say that with a big C and with a small C, um, you know, they're asking the question today, is Theresa May a traitor? We never thought we'd use that word, but many of our listeners think she has. So there is outrage in the country. Uh, You've had two senior resignations. And my own view is that if Theresa May stays as prime minister, we will not get the Brexit we voted for. We'll finish up with something that we're calling Brino, Brexit in name only. And I passionately hope that far from just resigning, that these cabinet ministers now bring Theresa May down. Well, what will what what has to happen? Tell, give us the the trajectory of how this would go if it would force her to step down. How many more cabinet members would have to step up? What has to happen in in Parliament? Well, uh, what has to happen is there have to be about fifty conservative members of Parliament uh, who say we need to have a motion of confidence. Uh, debate within the Conservative Parliamentary Party on the future of the Prime Minister. So 50 of them have to step up and say, this simply can't continue. And my feeling is that when they go back this weekend to their constituencies, and they meet, you know, get outside the London bubble, and they meet ordinary people, I think a lot of them will say, gosh, if we don't do something about this, the Conservative Party is doomed and we'll finish up with the hard-left socialist Jeremy Corbyn winning the next election. So I, I could be wrong, but I think the direction of travel means that Mrs. May is toast. Yeah, it doesn't seem like she, to me, has a future, but, you know, you're the expert. But, but now people are looking at the UK Independence Party anew, and you have said that you would st- step up and stand again uh, to lead UKIP if uh, Brexit is not... Uh, truly accomplished. When are you going to make decisions about that? Well, Laura, you know, we've known each other for a few years. Uh, you know me. I was actually a businessman. I was, no, I no, never you didn't want to do this. Mm-hmm. No, I never wanted to do this, but I did it because I could see nobody else had the guts to bloody well do it. So I did it. Uh, we succeeded. And if that's going to be betrayed, I will have no choice next spring but to put myself forward to go back in the front line. I hope I don't have to do it. Uh, because I hope the Conservative Party comes to its senses, gets rid of Mrs. May, and gets Brexit back on track. But, you know, when I say I will do this next spring, if things have not improved, that is not a threat. It's a promise. Well, I, that's I, that's a relief to hear, frankly, for uh, people like me, a populist in the United States, who were cheering you all the way the night of the referendum. I stayed up all night watching that. Watch that referendum. It was one of the most fun. <laughs> I was I was like a party at my house. We were thrilled. We did the whole show on it the next day. You came on. It was awesome. Uh, N- Nigel, what the? I saw that the numbers for UKIP, the UK Independence Party. Uh, economic nationalist pro sovereignty party in in uh, in Britain had gone up, so it's still pretty low. But the support for UKIP had gone up over the past week, yeah, uh, by two or three percentage yeah, points. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, we got it up to. I mean, in 2014, when we contested the European elections, we actually won it. I mean, we beat the Labour and Conservative parties, and it was the first time since before the First World War 
that a party that wasn't Labour or Conservative had won a national election. So we did get it to some pretty heady levels. Um, the trouble was, once Brexit was done, once the vote had happened, the voters quite naturally thought, do you know what, job done, we don't need UKIP anymore. But yes, you're right, uh, there is an uptick of support for UKIP, the numbers are not great, there is an uptick for UKIP, um, and, and look, you know, this is now entirely in the hands of Conservative members of Parliament, they need to recognise that this Prime Minister is not going to honour the referendum. They need to get rid of her. If they don't, they will face destruction. Well, the Tories, I mean, what's sad is that the Tories were like basically the Republican establishment. And the Republican establishment ended up getting totally embarrassed by Donald Trump. They got embarrassed because they they weren't serving the interests of the people. Same thing. That's right. I mean, the one big difference is this. Donald Trump was able to do what he did within the Republican movement because you have a system of open primaries, right? We do not have open primaries in this country. If we had, I would have made my own mission uh, to take over the Conservative Party from within. As that avenue wasn't open, I had to set up a different political party. So it's actually harder to change things in the UK, much harder than it is in America. Um, but, you know, as I say, um, I proved everybody wrong, Laura. No one thought my campaign would succeed. We did succeed. We won a referendum. And if the political establishment and the Euro elites betray that, then they'll have me to fight again. Um, and if I come back to this, if I have to do this all over again, believe you me, next time, no more Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> I'm coming over there. I've got to come over there and just do my show from there for a week when this happens. Well, D- Nigel Farage, yeah, we're like we're like joined at the hip on the uh, on the sovereignty push and the economic nationalism. And I just uh, you know I I actually did think you could win. I was one of the few people who even covering UKIP when when the sovereignty movement really began. So I'm you know I'm just so thrilled that you know that Brexit Brexit ultimately passed, but not surprised that the elites wanted to claw back control of of the uk i'm not surprised at all this is i mean this is what they always do they're trying to claw it back from trump now yeah that's absolutely right but you know what i think the tide of history is on our side the brexit vote the trump vote the italian elections the wind is with us they're you know they're mounting this desperate fight back we will win uh nigel farage uh here on the laura ingram show nigel thanks so much